Good morning. Happy Easter. A year ago, I was in a room all by myself with a camera talking to people I hope was on the other end. And uh, they put that chair there in case they're afraid I might get tired. Somebody asked, what if, happen what if something happens to you while you're speaking? And I've told our staff, if I go down, my notes are on the table, just finish the message. And then someone said, the second person has to finish the message because the first person should actually not just step over you and preach the message, they should take you out and then that's how that works. Uh, by the way, I do want to say thank you uh, to Jonathan Sigmund, uh, to Carrie Starr, uh, to Stephen Nichols, and to John Iacucci for doing an unbelievably phenomenal job bringing spiritually nutritious food to our church family for the last few weeks. Didn't they do a great job? Amen. So here today we're focused on one thing that could mean a lot more to us than maybe we imagined. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, it says, On the evening that was the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Couldn't we use a phrase like that today? And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. It's been quite a year, and uh, a lot of people have experienced some rather personal and painful things over the last 12 months. I find it interesting that a lot of what we have been going through was something that the people closest to Jesus were going through on the very day that is the anniversary that we're celebrating. Uh, Mary is outside of the tomb. You can read her experience earlier, earlier in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20. She's so stricken with grief that tears are rolling down her face and she's crying. She can barely look into the tomb. She can't enter it. But maybe you've been in a place where you've experienced grief like that. And and her, she's just weighted down. I, I think a lot of people have gone through significant grief over the last 12 months. Some of us have had loved ones that have died and funerals had to be postponed or attended virtually or very few people gathered in a room. I've, I've done funerals in the last year for where there's as, as few as six people in the room and no one can get close to each other. Um, we have people that we love that we've been distanced from for their safety, parents and grandparents who are struggling to be able to care for themselves. And from a distance, we've watched some level of decline and maybe increased confusion. And the, the grief is real. And, and Mary was experiencing incredible grief, and many of us in this room are too. So maybe there's something that happened to Mary that will help us. Thomas was interesting. Usually when he's referred to by people who've been around church for very long, uh, they have a word that precedes his name, and it's doubting Thomas. And, and he gets that reputation because what happened was he made a determination. He told his fellow disciples, I don't believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. And until I see him with my own eyes and touch him with my own hands, until I see the wounds that they inflicted on him on the cross, I'm not going to believe. And for almost all of my life, I thought, well, that was just a statement about Jesus, but it was actually a bigger statement than that. He was telling the people that he was the closest friends with, that he'd had the closest relationship with, that he didn't just do life with once a, a week for an hour. It was every single day. They walked together, they ate together, they did everything together. And he's telling them, I don't believe you. 
Just incredible doubt. I think our culture has created all new kinds of level of doubt. We don't know who we can believe. We doubt things are as good as we are told, and we doubt things are as bad as we are told, and we just don't know who we can trust anymore. Even people who we used to put a lot of credibility in that were close to us, we don't know what their sources of information are, and they'll come to us very excited or worked up about something, and we don't know if we can buy into it. And then the disciples were hiding. Uh, their conversations were awkward. If you've ever been around people who are afraid, it's really an uncomfortable environment to be in. Their hope was gone. Their fear was at an all-time high. If they could take Jesus, the leader of their movement, out and crucify him publicly, it wasn't a, uh, something that was done quietly and in a corner, what kind of purge would follow to rid the culture of people who named themselves after him? So they couldn't risk being seen. How they would come and leave the room would have been very carefully guarded secrets. And when they were in the room, the door was locked. And if somebody knocked on the door, there would be a quiet hush that would follow, fall across the room. They tried to imagine a different kind of future, but all they could imagine was getting caught and being killed. It was a lot of fear. And I think a lot of people have struggled with fear over the last 12 months. Maybe part of your concern is that you would be infected with a virus that swept our globe. Uh, I'm told that nearly 130 million people globally have been infected with this virus, and nearly 3 million of them did not survive that infection. The funerals were had for lots of people with a lot less people in the room. There are some who are afraid that a lot of this was just some giant hoax that was uh, intended to limit personal freedom and increase governmental control over our lives, and that was going to alter our future. Some people have been afraid that they've been missing out on important moments in life. If you're a young adult, you know this is a, a window of opportunity. There are going to be things that, that you can do now that you won't get to do later in your life, and it feels like the culture has closed all those doors and you're missing out on something. And if you are a grandparent and your, your grandchildren are growing and you've not been able to get together with them, you feel like you're missing out on something and people have been afraid of that. Some people are, are afraid that, that the measures that have been taken were not nearly enough for the risk that, was, that, that is in play. And so they would just prefer we don't do anything. Like just everybody stay home. And some have been become afraid to meet with family members, not because they're afraid of catching a virus, but they're now afraid of the unfiltered and heated language that is used to defend their position or demean yours. There are people who don't get together with family now, not because of a virus, but because of the kinds of conversations that happen. There are some that are afraid for their children that their children could get sick, or with it being out of school for a year, that they're not going to be able to catch up, and it's going to affect their lives in some way. And I know this will seem strange. I'm sure it didn't happen in New York, but I've heard it has happened in other states where people were afraid politically, afraid that their political party or their political candidate wouldn't win election, or even more afraid if the other party and the other candidate won elections. And both conservatives and progressives told us that if the opposing party won democracy as we know it was over, we were told that. We were afraid our country would be torn apart by racial injustice, that our economy would collapse and we wouldn't be able to provide for our own families, that the people responsible for enforcing the law would either overreact or fail to react to very serious situations. There have been good friends that we've had for many years, and we're afraid to have interactions with them because we're afraid now we will be misunderstood. If you've been angry at all over the last 12 months, there's a really good chance that the source of that anger is actually fear. There's a thing called fight or flight syndrome. The fight part is a real thing, and our culture has done a lot of both. 
with all that we're facing, with all that we're carrying, with all that we're enduring, there are a lot of people who are saying, they're asking this question, so what difference does it make if a man who was put to death over 2,000 years ago, somebody saw him alive after his funeral? It doesn't help me with my grief. It doesn't help me with my fear. It doesn't help me with my doubt. What difference does it make? And I actually think that's a really good question, and it's one that deserves some serious attention. What if the resurrection of Jesus is the only thing that can comfort our grief, that can resolve our doubts, and that can quiet our fears? It did for the characters in the story that we read about today. So, I think Christians rightly focus a great deal on the cross and the crucifixion, the price that was paid by Jesus. Um, I think that lots of people wish that forgiveness were just a decision that God would make rather than a price that would have to be paid, but a real debt had to be paid and God was willing to pay it himself. We don't think as much about the resurrection. We know that because of the cross, our sins are forgiven, but what happens as a result of the resurrection? What are the personal benefits that flow towards me? So I think three things about this, and I'd like to take the rest of my time this morning talking about them. And the first is this, is that the resurrection of Jesus is rational. It's rational. I know there are people in our world that think it's impossible and unlikely, and that people who actually believe it have just fallen prey to some legend or folklore that's been handed down through the ages. And so I'd like to just challenge that point of view a little bit. I'm often asked if I can prove that Jesus rose from the dead. And the answer is, no, I can't. Not the same way you prove that water boils at 212 degrees. If you've got a heat source in a container with water and a thermometer, you can reproduce that scientific experiment over and over and over again. But this is not a scientific experiment. It's a historical event. And when you think about it, everything that has been an historical event, including the resurrection of Jesus, is not something that's reproducible. But we often believe historical events. We believe that people served as kings or presidents or leaders of various nations and organizations. We believe that certain events happened at certain times and in certain places, not because that's reproducible, but because there's serious evidence. Um, there, are, there are people who were witnesses. There are writings that occurred at that time. There are historians that have undertaken the rigor of determining what was fact and actually happened and, and what was just legend or folklore that got handed down. And, and so people do believe that those events occur. So what about the resurrection of Jesus? Well, there actually is considerable evidence. Multitudes of people who had opposing worldviews changed their minds. I know, we just gloss over that like it's nothing. Do you know anybody that's changed their mind on anything in 12 months? Because I don't. Everybody just doubles down now. What would it be like for you to change your view on politics? What would that take? There's somebody in the room going right now, resurrected Jesus would have to stand in front of me and tell me. And maybe that's what it would take. Jewish theology did not believe it was possible for God to become human or a human to be God. And yet thousands, multitudes of people who not only believed that, but taught that. They were, they were Jewish priests, many of which became believers in Jesus, changed their mind. What changed their mind? And it wasn't just a well-articulated argument. They ran into the resurrection. In that world, in that time, the worldview of both Jews and Romans 
was not to believe in the resurrection. The Jewish people believed that there would be a resurrection, but it would occur at the end of all things in the final judgment when all of the righteous would be raised at the same time. To have an example of that before that time was considered theologically unacceptable. And for the Romans, they didn't want to be resurrected. They thought that the material world was corrupt and their goal was to be free from it. When their spirit separated from their body, they never wanted to come back. And yet multitudes, tens of thousands of people who had a different worldview on resurrection changed their mind. What changed their mind? There were actually witnesses of the resurrected Jesus and not just one or two but hundreds, Paul says, over 500 witnesses at one time. Over, if, if you were on a jury in a courtroom and they brought in over 500 witnesses to give testimony and all of them agreed, would you really sit in the jury box and go, I know they all agree, I just don't buy it. Would we do that? And by the way, the people who made those statements, they were still alive at the time that the Gospels were being circulated. When Paul writes about them in, in his letters, he says most of these people are still alive. He even gives you some of the names, and he said you could go ask them for yourselves. And by the way, those people, they paid an incredible price for sharing that information. They weren't just mocked for sharing that. They were murdered. They were tortured. They were fed to wild beasts. They were burned alive. It was way more serious than getting called out on social media. Why didn't they say, well, it's what I thought I saw, but I guess I could be wrong. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, they had integrity. That's not what helped them tell the truth about what they had seen. It's that once they saw the resurrected Jesus, that killed their fear of death. Death was no longer the last thing. It wasn't the bitter end. There was something more. There was something better. There was something unending. There was something that was very real, and you couldn't scare them with death anymore. Peter, prior to the resurrection, was the kind of guy who could be intimidated by a servant girl. She asks him three times in a courtyard when he's warming himself by a fire if he knows who Jesus is, and three times he denies it. He ever knew him, didn't have any idea who this person was. And yet, after the resurrection of Jesus, it doesn't matter what you threaten that guy with. He will stand up and he will speak up because he's no longer afraid of death. The resurrection is rational, and the resurrection is powerful. You know how much it takes for you to get out of bed this morning. Some people didn't make it. <laughs> it was too much. They, they, they looked at the ceiling, and they felt the warmth of their blanket, and they pulled it over their head, and they are there still, and they, they will watch us on demand later today. You know what it takes to get your family going. And some morning it takes all that you've got. You know what it takes to recover from an injury or from surgery. You know what it takes to keep showing up for work, to keep showing up for your family, to sh keep showing up for school, to keep showing up for your team. It takes everything you've got. So what does it take to walk out of a tomb? I'm not talking about three minutes of no respirations, no pulse, no blood pressure. I'm talking three days. I know the ancient world didn't have our technology, but they weren't stupid. They could tell when death claimed someone they loved or an enemy. Their lives depended on being able to discern that. So how much power does it take to bring someone back from the dead? It's been a common theme in books and movies for most of human history, that someone would seek that power, not just to build an empire or control massive amounts of money, but to bring someone back that they love so dearly. And they knew it would be more power than they had ever seen in the world. Everyone agrees it's the hardest thing to do. We have power that can end life. We don't have power that can bring it back from the dead.
There'll come a moment in your life, if you live long enough, that a medical professional will share some information and some news with you. They'll say something like this, I'm sorry, but it's over. There's nothing more that we can do. If I had any option, I would exercise it. I'm sorry. And when they say if they had an option, they would exercise it, they mean it. That power is not at their disposal. It was for Jesus. The resurrection is powerful. You could harness all the electricity that humans are able to produce and add to it all the volts of every bolt of lightning that's ever fallen from the sky and include all the energy we're able to create through atomic and nuclear weapons. And not all of that combined can bring a person back from the dead. We can create power that can take lives and lots of lives, but we can't create power that can bring life back from the dead. We can save lives, we can extend life, we can create life, we cannot bring life back from the dead. What kind of God are we dealing with? Not just a God who can spin untold numbers of stars and suns into space and create planets and moons and, 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 and plants and animals and people and birds and fish. I don't know how much power that took, but I can tell you that it is nothing in comparison to the power it takes to bring something back from the dead. Resurrection is powerful, but resurrection is also personal. I hear lots of news that has no direct impact on me. Uh, did anybody notice that one of the largest ships in the world got stuck in the Suez Canal? Did anybody notice that? Did that affect anybody's life? I was told by large numbers of people how much joy they found in that. Yeah, it, it's like, well, if they can get stuck, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> I mean, so I'm a little stuck. It's not that big a deal. And after they finally got it unstuck, by the way, this actually happened. They've got a picture of this on television, and it's on our screen. And, and for those of you who know me, I'm a, I'm a, a, I like to solve problems, or at least try. And, and I'm getting so energized by the thought, and, and I'm actually, I'm standing now, and I'm, I'm right next to the TV, and I'm pointing, you know, if they would just do this, and my wife takes her phone out, and I know what she's going to do. She's going to take a picture or a video and she's going to post it for everyone in the world to see. I said, you put that away. And she said, I'm just going to send it to Jonathan. <laughs> and then Jonathan would post it for everybody to see. <laughs> she told Jonathan that she was going to do that. And Jonathan said, well, he's back. That's what that means. What I heard from a lot of people after the fact was there were memes on social media, put it back. <laughs> they found such joy in the ship being stuck. It really didn't, it's possible to increase the cost of something in my life down the road, but no personal loss, no difference. There are things I'm completely ignorant of that are happening in our world makes no difference to me. There are things that I may know, information I may have, it doesn't really affect me. There are things that I know I should care about and shamefully don't because it has no personal impact on me. And for lots of people, including in this room, the resurrection has had no personal impact. You're willing to consider it possibly happened, but what difference does it make? You can show up in worship, you can sing songs, you can listen to religious teachings. We can hope our past has been forgiven, but at the end of the day, we're a lot like Mary, outside of environments we wish we could enter, enter but our tears and our sorrow keeps us from going in. Or like Thomas, or we're afraid to believe something good because we don't think our hope can be dashed one more time. 
or like the disciples, locking the doors, hushing our tones, afraid that the best day we've ever lived is nothing more than a memory, and what lies ahead is a problem. Resurrection has to become personal. If it doesn't, a lot of collateral damage gets done in our life. Dreams die, shouting suffocates, resolve, running always takes, running away always takes less energy than standing up and staying. Truth winds up being not spoken, hopes and dreams are not shared, and eventually we all wind up saying the same things we never want to hear someone say to us. Nothing's going to change. There's nothing more I can do. It's over. And that is being surrounded by a kind of darkness and confined in ways that feels a lot like a tomb. There are lots of people who still have a pulse, they still have respirations, they still have blood pressure, but they're no longer living. Resurrection hasn't become personal. This is what it says, now I ask the worship team to come out. Paul began to think about this. If you don't know who Paul is, he's one of, the, one of the chief leaders of the early church. And the more he thought about the resurrection, how rational it was, how powerful it was, how personal it was, he penned these words in Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. It's personal. He would say this in Philippians 3. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. It meant something to him that it was personal. We all desire life-creating and health-restoring power, and it's a good thing. But here's what's true and terrifying and why days like today matter as much as they do. There are things that we don't want to hope for anymore because the loss of them was too great. We would rather stay outside of tombs and behind locked doors and eyes closed as much as possible. And you're living in a tomb when you do that. Jesus didn't just come to prove that the grave couldn't hold him. He came to share resurrection power with anyone who put their faith in him. There's a life you can live. And it's what he's called us to. It's what he's paid for. It's what he offers. And it's available. So if you're in the room, maybe maybe you are finally to the place in your life where you're no longer willing to argue that you're perfect, that you've never done anything that was wrong. Or maybe you've even gotten to the place where your argument has become not just I haven't done anything wrong, and those things didn't matter, but I've crossed some lines that I, I seriously regret, but you don't know what to do about it. Well, the cross addresses that. There's a price that's been paid, but it's also true. That there's a life to be lived. And if you find yourself being held down and held back by grief and doubt and fear, then maybe today is the day you take the step in faith that helps resurrection power become personal for you. So if you're in the room and I wish I had more options than I had available to me today, I don't. So if you're in the room, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a minute. I'm I'm gonna ask you to hold it up long enough for me to be able to see it and recognize you. I can't bring you up, I, I can't. I can't interact with you as personally as I would like, but I would like to pray for you in just a minute. So if you're here today and you do want assurance that your faults and your failures are forgiven and you do want your future unlocked through what Christ did for you 
and his resurrection power. Then starting over at these windows, I just want you to raise your hand, just hold your hand up. And when I acknowledge it, you can put it back down and I'll go from that end of the room to this end of the room. So anyone on this side of the room, just raise your hand up right now. Just raise your hand up right now. I see that hand. Anyone else? Moving over a little bit more. Just raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Just If you're raising your hand, just keep it up until I acknowledge you. Let's bow our heads. Father, uh, the truth is, is that we can go about our lives without living. And we can carry a sense of debt and grief. We can be make our decisions based on doubt. And we can be so afraid that we never take a step of faith. Your resurrection power, would you make that available to every person that raised their hand today? In Jesus' name, amen. And if you are watching online, I just would encourage you, there's also an option for you to acknowledge that you made that decision today. Let's all stand this morning.